What I'd like to do today is have a kind of a conversation about um, cheese and dairy. What I want to do is, is draw a little bit back and go back a little bit in history to start off with and talk about uh, the dairy industry in Wisconsin. But first, I'm going to take us back to where cheese got started first. So early men used to bring either goats, sheep, or cows along with them so they would have milk and they would drink the milk. And if they wanted, they would ha had a source of meat. So they would use these animals as important sustenance for them as they were, as they were um, developing. So cows, sheep, and goat were very close to man as they domesticated those. That's probably at least 10,000 years ago. Cheese making spread across Europe, and primarily one of the one of the groups that was very important in spreading cheese making across across Europe was the Romans. If you remember, the Roman Empire covered much of the modern world at that stage, and countries that didn't have cheese making got cheese making because the Romans loved cheese. That brought cheese into the UK when the Romans came there. They didn't have it before, as far as we know, and then the English who came over here in the, uh, in, in the Mayflower, et cetera, they brought cheese making to the US. Primarily, cheese, early cheese making here in the US was focused mostly out of places like New York and so on. So the early capital of dairy here in the, in the US, or the main places of dairy, was New England, New York. The early settlers here in Wisconsin, going back to around 1800 to 1830, were primarily Yankee farmers that came from New England that had spread west into the, the states as they were opening up. And they brought their cheese making uh, experience with them. But primarily those Yankee farmers, as we would call them now, those Yankee farmers were interested in wheat. So Wisconsin at that time was considered America's breadbasket and that it was the cause of damming lots of our rivers here within the, the state to actually have mills to um, process the wheat. So crop yields from wheat started to go down, and they started to look about somewhere else. So by the time, just after the Civil War here in the state, Wisconsin was at a, a significant crossroads. It had been America's breadbasket for, for several decades and produced massive amounts of wheat, but it was really wondering what to do. A lot of farmers were losing money and going out of business. There was an influx of Norwegians, uh, uh, Germans, Italians, Swiss were starting to migrate into Wisconsin around that time. They were bringing their knowledge of dairy. They're also the, uh, the growing of crops, feed crops and other crops to feed the animals. And they also brought their cheese making knowledge as well from their home countries. So over the last couple of decades of um, the previous century, not the century, the century before, up till about 1900, there was a major change within Wisconsin from being the breadbasket before that to becoming a growing dairy state. And it took another couple of decades before Wisconsin passed out New York in terms of milk production or even cheese production. The second major thing was that a dairy school was founded at the UW-Madison, and the first dairy school was at 1890 and there still is a dairy program going on, and I work in that dairy program. And that created training and short courses and activities related to training people on how to process milk, how to make cheese, how to standardize cheese, and so on. One of the things Wisconsin did that distinguished itself from all the other states, and it's true to this day, is they said, we must protect quality in the state, not just quantity, we must protect quality. And what did that mean? They said, you're going to need to be licensed to do any key thing. So if you want to make cheese, you're going to need a cheesemaker's license. That requires over 240 hours of apprenticeship to be able to make it. It requires you pass an exam. If you want, we were just talking downstairs about grading cheese to know which cheese is good and bad and whether it'll age well. That's a licensed thing as well. If you want to pasteurize milk, you got to need a license for that. So Wisconsin became very, um, very focused on making sure that everybody was trained and had licenses, not just anybody making the stuff. Now, as these plants got bigger, um, the smaller ones disappeared. And over the, the decades, we're now down to only 200 dairy plants in the state, with about 120 plus cheese plants within the state. 
So that, that is from the 2000 <laughs> down to 123. These plants range from the biggest ones you will finally find in the US, or close to the biggest ones in the US, down to the artisan with some sheep or goats and small uh, production that they're making on a daily basis. We have all of those. However, that has not been that Wisconsin has disappeared from the dairy universe. We're still America's dairy land. So right now, we produce a quarter of all cheese produced in the US. And to give you an idea what that means globally, if Wisconsin was a country, sometimes we do think ourselves as a country here in Wisconsin too, I know, we would be the fourth largest cheese producing country in the world, okay? So that is significant amount of cheese. We just talked about the price of milk mm -hmm. being low now compared to what it was five or ten years ago. Yep. How do they price milk? And, and what were the prices five years ago or ten years ago compared to now? Yep. So prices have gone up and gone down. The, there, there was a period about five years ago where the milk prices were over $20 a hundredweight, and now they're down about 15 So that's a significant reduction. It wasn't always as high as that, so it has gone up, up and down over the years and cycles. The, the federal, the, the problem is there, there are classes of milk going for different type of uses. Some milk is used to make bottled milk, some milk is used to make cheese, and some milk is for other purposes. Each of those has their own classes. Milk pricing in the US is very complicated, much more complicated than any other country in the world as far as I'm aware, primarily because it's driven by the federal system the federal milk pricing and market orders. I don't think that's an easy thing to fix. There are some suggestions that have come out to try and tweak that or adjust that or change some of the classes, but knowing the way the federal government works on anything, I wouldn't hold my, hold my hat on anything happening soon. One of the problems, as I said, is that over the last four or five years, some, we expect to export some of our milk and some type of product. Right now, about 15% of the milk we produce in the U.S. gets exported. To, to really get, to move the needle in terms of price back to the farmers, the prediction is we'd probably need to export about 20% of our milk in some shape or form. And there is ambitious goals by the U.S. Dairy Export Council and factories to get more milk exported, because if we can get more milk and get some good price for it somewhere in the world, then we have more value here at home. We're not flooding our own market. That's kind of simplistically the way they're thinking about it. Does where a cow is raised, does that affect their quality of milk in any way, shape, or form? So it really depends on the customer and what they want, is my short answer. Yes, milk and what they feed on can make a difference to the color, but also can affect some of the nutrients in there as well. So there's higher levels of things like CLA, which is conjugated linoleic acid, which is getting a lot of excitement for you know, maybe an anti-cancer, maybe anti-obesity. But the levels are maybe not high enough in our milk or our butter to maybe be, have a huge impact on our health, but there's a lot of interest on it as well. So definitely what the cows, yeast can affect the cows eat can affect their flavors.